Hi everyone, I'm Andrew Hoffman. I'm a software engineer, a security researcher, and a technical author based out of the Pacific Northwest. Today, I'm going to explain to you how cross-site request forgery attacks, aka CSERF, work. I'm going to walk you through a CSRF attack. I'm going to explain to you what's going on behind the scenes, why it's so dangerous, and what some people do to attempt to mitigate these, including some mitigations that don't actually work. So this will give you some insight into how the attack works, what people do to try to stop these attacks, and maybe even give you some insight into which one of these mitigations are easy to bypass. So for starters, cross-site request forgery attacks are typically abbreviated as CSERF. According to Wikipedia though, it can also be called the one-click attack, session writing, or XSRF. Generally speaking, if you're looking for any type of literature that's serious on cross-site request forgery. For example, if you're looking for like an academic paper, you'll see it either spelled out like this or written as CSRF. So what is a CSRF attack? Well, a CSRF attack is an attack in which a end user, so let's just say you're logged into your YouTube account, you own that YouTube account, and there's a relationship between you and YouTube where you pass back some identifiers with each request and as a result of that, YouTube knows that you're privileged and allows you to do operations like, for example, uploading new videos, deleting existing videos, changing your avatar, etc. Now you can do that because you have this privileged relationship with your YouTube account. You've proven who you are. Now, a hacker or another malicious actor that does not have access to your YouTube account would not be able to upload videos on your behalf, delete videos on your behalf, or change your avatar. So what they might do is try to find a way to get your browser to trick YouTube into thinking a request is coming on behalf of you, the account owner, when in reality that request is coming on behalf of a malicious user. And you can see in the Wikipedia page here that CSERF vulnerabilities are nothing new and unfortunately they're very widespread. You can see that Netflix has been vulnerable to CSERF attacks, various banking applications, YouTube was vulnerable to CSERF attacks in 2008, and this allowed an attacker to perform almost any action of a user. Fortunately, that has been patched. Even McAfee Secure was vulnerable to CSERF, uh, a business that claims to build on top of their reputation for security was vulnerable to CSERF attacks. Well, let's demonstrate a CSERF attack and maybe it will become a little bit more clear. So this is DVWA, AKA DAM Vulnerable Web Application, version 1.10. So this is an application that is on purpose full of security vulnerabilities for the sake of education, for the sake of testing, etc. And I'm using this application to demonstrate a simple CSERF attack. So on this page, you can see that there is a form field that allows you to change your admin password. So let's try changing our password to test. When we click change, a network request occurs and it says password changed. We don't even have to go to the network tab to know what network request occurred because we can look up here and we can see that we're at localhost vulnerability CSERF, so that's the tab right here. But then after the question mark, there's a query parameter, password underscore new equals test. So what's going on here is that there's this thing called HTTP, and this is a method of sending information over the web that browsers have chosen to adopt. It's a protocol. And HTTP has these verbs, which are different ways of interacting with servers. The default or the most commonly used one is called a HTTP GET request. So whenever you see a hyperlink, for example, the majority of these are hyperlinks, what's going on behind the scenes is you click on a link You'll see this one right here is a hyperlink that goes to OWASP, OWASP.org slash index, etc. So when you click on a hyperlink, any hyperlink, your browser is going to perform an HTTP GET request using the HTTP protocol and the GET verb. And that is a specific methodology for talking with a server. That methodology allows you to pass back query params. Generally speaking, GET requests are intended to be used for retrieving information. When you start to use them for setting or modifying information, that's when you run into some issues. So let's just go with this fact that this URL is capable of changing state. So here I am in JSBin. 
an application that allows you to create jo arbitrary JavaScript and HTML websites for the sake of testing. Now, because HTTP GET is the language of hyperlink, if clicking on this link changes your password, which we know it does, then password underscore new, the parameter here, could be set to anything. So we could set it to, for example, test5. And by clicking on this hyperlink, you would change the password of the currently signed in user. So how does this work in practice? So imagine a website is vulnerable to CSERF attacks. And the CSERF attack is a state changing GET request. Now what can happen is someone can distribute a hyperlink and trick you into clicking it. You'll see the hyperlink here doesn't even have to say that it's pointing to this website. It can say anything the user wants, anything the user wants. So you can, you can send them a link that appears as if it's going to Amazon. If they're not paying close attention, when they click on it, it really goes back to this web application and the server interprets it as, hey, we're doing a password change. Now by clicking on that, your password has been changed to something that the malicious actor, AKA the hacker, is aware of, he can log into your account, and he can change things, etc. So state changing GET requests are the most common form of CSERF. Cool. So we can summarize this by saying, CSERF attacks occur when your privileged relationship with a server is compromised because a malicious actor has found a way to convince your browser to make requests to that server on your behalf, as if it were coming from you, but it's actually coming from the malicious actor who either convinced you to initiate it or tricked you somehow or tricked the browser. One of the most common mitigations you'll see is to use post requests because the HTTP get obviously can be clicked on but the other another verb HTTP post you have to include parameters in the body and the web browser does make it a little bit harder to initiate HTTP post requests on behalf of a user but it's not very hard. For example, a web form like this on another page could point back to the server, the API that powers this website. And web forms, by default, initiate HTTP POST requests. So ultimately, there's a number of mitigations people think work, and there's some that may work conditionally, but if you're trying to protect against CSERF attacks, the only or the best proven way that you can do this is each time you generate a web page, you want to keep a secret code that's randomly generated and you want to attach that to the web page and only accept the data if the data comes back with that secret code attached to it. This is often called an anti CSERF token. So once again, in order to prevent a user, a malicious actor from being able to initiate requests on your behalf, you need to engineer your applications such that there's some data sent from the server to the client and sent back, which is verified so that a random link or a ram random web form from another page cannot make use of your privileged relationship with the website that you're authenticated and using at the current time.